welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host as always, Marcus Sidhu, and today we've got part two of our two-part series where my clients, Carmen and Krista DeCamillis, are interviewing me. So in this part two episode, we are going to get into a whole bunch of stuff, including my three top tips for someone starting on their fat loss journey. We're going to delve into what's harder. So is it the physical aspect? Is it the mental aspect? Is it the emotional aspect of weight loss? What is the most difficult and where do people get hung up? I'm going to be talking about what podcasts I listen to, how I keep up with media health trends and documentaries like Game Changers. Do I work with vegans and vegetarians via nutritional programming? What are my thoughts on the ketogenic diet? What I think of cleanses and detox diets for fat loss? How I order when I'm eating out at restaurants, so how I mod things? What does a typical day look like for me? Do I have any productivity tips to share? And then lastly, what a regular day of eating looks like for myself. So we're going to delve right in here. I hope you enjoy it. Now, if you had to give someone who wants to get health, nutrition, fitness, and all of that stuff back on track but has no clue where to start, what couple pieces of advice would you give them? What do you guys think I would say in this situation? <laughs> um, movement, nutrition, and sleep, and stress management. Nailed it. That was, it's, it's, there's no, there's no tricks. There's no, it's just, I would, first of all, if, if we wanted to get specific with that, nutrition, it would be food environment. So if you don't want to eat mm-hmm. something, like just keep foods around that you want to eat, ditch the ones that you don't. So make it easy on yourself. Yeah. Movement, eight to 10,000 steps a day. That's your goal. Sleep, seven to nine hours. And honestly, if you button up those three, the stress management, you're just going to have a way easier time because that's going to relieve a ton of stressors in your life and just make you feel better and more resilient overall. So you guys know, like, and, and everybody kind of knows that. They just want to hear like, There's some, you know, (laughs) sweet underground tip or trick and it's like, no. (laughs) Yeah. I think people just want it to be fast. 100%. But it's such a, or it can be a very slow process depending on the person and the effort. Right. And slow is, um, slow is just an opinion because the process is what the process is. It's not necessarily slow or fast. It just is. And they're just comparing it to essentially nothing. Just like, oh, no, but I want it to be faster. That's why they're saying it's slow. So Mm -hmm. it's um, like if you look at muscle gain, for example, muscle gain is a way slower process than fat loss. Fat loss is fucking really fast. Like people can drop tons of weight really quickly when they're committed. But if you want to build muscle, you can only build it so fast. Um, And so that's a way slower process. So for people that want want to build muscle, you have to be even more patient than folks that are dealing with fat loss, which is probably crazy to think when when somebody has fat loss as a goal because it feels subjectively really slow. What would you say is the hardest part about being on a weight loss journey? Would you say dropping the actual pounds or more the mental side of it? Oh, but by far the mental and emotional aspects. It's not even, it's not even close. Um, the, physical, the physical aspects are really straightforward, actually. Everybody knows what to do. But doing it is the hard part, and that's where the mental and the emotional Mm -hmm. aspect comes in. And so the physical, the physical just follows, you know, it just, your physical body essentially does what it's told in a fat loss scenario. So if you consume fewer calories than you burn, your body is going to lose fat. But how you go about that, the actual implementation, the mental mind games, the emotional aspects, the this, the that, that is by far the most difficult part because we're emotional creatures and and the the physical is really the simple part because it's responding to your mental and emotional inputs that are making those decisions or the behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah, that's so true. I think just getting into like a mind frame of this is what you want and what, what are the actions you're, that you're going to do to, to get there? A hundred percent. Yeah. If if you've established what you want, it's not a matter of if you're going to get there, it's just a matter of time. Who do you choose to listen to and get your information from in the fitness industry? And other than your podcast, what other fitness podcasts do you like to listen to? I, my favorite podcast right now is called The Drive, and it's by Peter Atia. He's a doctor in New York and San Diego, I think. I love his podcast. He is a doctor, so he delves into like nutrition and health and all that sort of stuff, but he also has just interesting interviews with guests about maybe mental health or emotional health or race car driving. He's really interested in race car driving, and I have never watched a Formula One race in my life. And I listened to his episode where he interviewed a former Formula One pro, and it was like fascinating. I, I knew nothing about Formula One. That's my favorite podcast right now. I really like Rob Wolf's podcast, Healthy Rebellion Radio, is really awesome. Danny Lennon, he's actually been, actually Rob's been on the podcast, and same with Danny. Danny has a podcast called Sigma Nutrition Radio that's amazing. It's a little bit more advanced so if you're just getting into health and fitness, you might that might be a little bit difficult to comprehend, but I really like his pod. And then there's a bunch of podcasts that I listen to that aren't actually, you know, fitness podcasts. Like if Tim Ferriss has a good guest on, I'll listen to that. If Rogan has a good guest, I'll listen to that. I don't listen to all of his his episodes or Tim Ferriss. It's just um, I have to be interested in the guest. Uh, what else? A lot of the time I'll go into the podcast app and search for people as opposed to podcasts. So mm. I'll search for people to see what podcast they've been interviewed on if I'm interested in what they have to say specifically. So that is just like maybe I type in Peter Atia because I want to hear him interviewed or whoever. So yeah, if you're starting out or you're at more of a basic level of fitness and you want like practical implementation i would recommend listening to my podcast but if you want something a little bit more advanced that delves into the research a little bit more i'd recommend sigma nutrition so danny lennon's podcast okay yeah i never honestly listened to podcasts until i (laughs) yours was the first and um just with that and getting the steps in every day was awesome because I'd be like close to home and there'd be like 20 minutes left on your episode and I would just keep wandering around the street. Oh, so nice. It, yeah. It was kind of a, I told Krista about that little tip too. After she told me, I started listening to podcasts when I was on vacation and I would just keep walking for days because I didn't want the <laughs> podcast to end. From a behavioral standpoint, sometimes it's hard to motivate yourself to like just walk, but mm-hmm. If you're learning along the way, it makes it a lot more enjoyable. Or if you pair up walking with a task, like I'm going to walk to the coffee shop and back, it makes it easier. Like there's some sort of, it's, it's just hard to motivate yourself to be like, just get steps, you know, because you're just yeah. like moving mindlessly at that point. But if you have, if you're learning or if you're going somewhere, then it makes it a lot more doable. How do you <clears> keep <throat> up with all the latest trends and news regarding health and nutrition? Um, also including documentaries on Netflix. Cause like, I know, for example, um, game changers is a newer documentary and I know a couple people that have watched it and are all of a sudden vegan, but like, what advice would you give people kind of watching, watching those types of things? So as far as keeping up with all the health trends and stuff like that, for, I actually don't really, which might sound kind of odd. But the, the basics are the basics, and they work. And so I, I do a lot of nutrition research and stuff like that. But as far as like the media trends, I, I don't follow them very much. I think that it's important to remember when it comes to something like Game Changers or a documentary on Netflix that's food-related is that first and foremost, it is entertainment. 
it is not that all that informative. You know, it, it, typically, typically, it's about entertainment. It's on fucking Netflix. The more entertaining it is, the more people that are going to watch it. And it's very like outlandish, and the statements are super out there. They're super dramatic. It's like it's not real life. Just like the current health trends would be in the media, where it's like, you know, new diet this, lose twenty mm-hmm. pounds in ten days that, and it's like that stuff is it's just noise. And yeah. so, I more so would listen to podcasts like I mentioned before to be informed because those people are professionals, they're experts in their field versus somebody, some random person that just got like picked off the street because they might be like interesting for some vegan documentary. It's like, all right. (laughs) If If somebody wants to go vegan and they feel great with that, awesome. Like more power to them. Um, but I think it's important to remember that that is entertainment. It's a movie, you know? Mm -hmm. That's so true. That's a good point. That's true because they would never have a movie about sleeping well, eating well, moving and managing your stress. Exactly. It's the most boring boring. movie ever. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's a good point too. And that's, and that's one of the reasons why on Instagram, for example, you'll see someone with these, insane statements that they're making they're like this really outlandish personality the information is shit quality but they might have 20 million followers you know whereas somebody the people that i follow most of them nobody knows who they are like nobody Mm -hmm. outside of this industry (laughs) knows even who they are and that's that's just that's the case for most things the the people that know the most are like operating behind the scenes getting their hands dirty and getting results and stuff they're not you know providing entertainment on instagram and stuff and it's and not to say that that's bad it's just you know it, it, there's a difference between solid information informative information and entertainment and if somebody can combine that then amazing they're going to hit the mm-hmm. jackpot but it's tough to do very true so if you have someone that uh wants to do one of those diets like say become a vegan or the keto diet or something like that is that something you would accommodate in a plan for them? I'll work with pescatarians and lacto-ovo vegetarians and then obviously people that eat everything. But I don't work with vegans because it com- becomes very nuanced and difficult to keep that person healthy via supplementation. Um, and I would advise them to get probably more frequent blood work than the average person because we've evolved to eat a very specific diet and it's included animal products. And so, and it doesn't have to be a lot of animal products, but that's how it's like a cat eating a vegetarian diet. Like that's not what it was meant to eat. Right. So I know that if there's vegans listening right now, they're probably like fucking absolutely (laughs) pissed, but it is what it is. Like I, 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 (laughs) this is not my opinion, (laughs) but if somebody wanted to do the ketogenic diet, I would absolutely implement that with sort of in the best way possible. So you could do a ketogenic diet where you only ate butter, bacon, and like coconut oil, or you could do the ketogenic (laughs) diet where you're eating like, you know, quality meat, fish, seafood, nuts, lots of vegetables, maybe a little bit of fruit. And so those are two very different things. And so I would help somebody implement that in the most helpful way possible if that was something that they wanted to do. But just as a side note, um, it's very hard to maintain the ketogenic diet long term. I have not met very many people that do it for more than a month or two at a time. I don't know about you guys. Like, It's one of those things where people are like, I'm keto. And then you see them three months later and they're like, yeah, that didn't last long. Yeah, I have someone at my work that um, him and his wife every few months are starting keto again on Monday kind of thing. And, but, um, whenever he's on it, he never seems like super healthy or like happy. He just seems very lethargic. And I know there's like the keto flu and all of that kind of stuff. And to me, I thought, and the amount of groceries he was saying that he was buying, I thought, Oh my gosh. And that's for one week, it was like $400 or something. And I'm like, I try and spend that much in like a month, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. you know? So I haven't personally heard any success stories. And I think it's, 
for me, it's, I think it's like the latest thing to do, but I don't think people actually really understand like the science behind it or why they would be doing it. It's just, I think people see that you can get quick results, which I think you can, but it's, I haven't seen any sustainability come from it personally. So yeah, there, there are people out there that will eat that way long term, but they're Mm -hmm. the outliers and as far as it's, there's an interesting sort of mental piece to low carb diets in general or ketogenic diets is carbohydrates are stored in your muscles and in your liver and they pull water with them. And so when you eliminate carbohydrates, you drop a bunch of water right off the bat. And when people have success on a diet very quickly, it's highly motivating. And so they're more likely to continue to do that. Now, when that person stops that low-carb diet, they're also going to regain that carbohydrate and water weight just as quickly as they lost it. And so that can be a bit of a mental mindfuck for folks. Now, I mean, there are populations, for example, people that have a lot of food sensitivities or digestion issues that might do well with the ketogenic diet. It's not that there's no place for it. It's a tool. But for the vast majority of folks, it's just, it's not really all that practical. Like, they find it hard to not eat, you know, any starchy cut. Like you can't even have potato or rice or like yams, which are like really all healthful foods. And so it's it's tough when you eliminate an entire food group. And at the end of the day, as far as the science, why it works, it, there's no secret there. It's how every other diet in the world works, and it's by controlling calorie intake. And when you eliminate an entire food group, so if you have protein, carbohydrates, and fat and you completely eliminate one of those, all of a sudden your food choices, like you have 33% less food choices overnight. And so the likelihood for you to overeat, because we just get sort of tired of eating the same foods, we're just like, ah, I don't even, like if you could only eat potato, you just get to a point where you're just like, I don't want any more potato, no matter like how hungry I am, you know what I mean? (laughs) How about I want to eat? And so when you eliminate food choices, you typically reduce calorie intake. There's a way around that. People can like, you know, crush an entire Costco bag size of almonds and, you know, gain fat on a ketogenic diet, but it's highly unlikely. Yeah. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on like cleanses and detox and all of those kind of fads as well? For fat loss? Mm Mm-hmm. I put together a, an episode on this recently. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but if somebody was interested, they could go listen to that. The like cleanses I would put in that noise category. So with the media and all that sort of, it's sort of just background noise. Like I am much more interested in somebody implementing and sustaining something long term versus seeing how much weight they can lose in a seven day period and then just going back to what they were doing before. Like, I just don't see how that is a long-term strategy. I know that some folks are like, I just need like a pick me up or a boost or whatever. But those same folks, like that's exactly what they don't need. They need like a lifestyle implementation because they were there three months ago. You know what I mean? They're doing a cleanse every three months. It's like, what are you doing? You know? And if, if somebody wants to just lose as much weight as possible in seven days because they have a beach vacation, like have at it. But I'm just not, it just has, I'm just not interested. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. I think we did one of those. I don't remember when it was like two years ago or something. It was like the wild rose cleanse or some silly thing that we bought at Whole Foods. And I don't know. I just, (laughs) it's funny, like looking back to that now and then seeing where I am today. And it's like, I'll never do any of those little you know, you can lose 10 pounds in a week kind of thing. It just, maybe you can, but it's, it's ridiculous and it's not sustainable. Um, the thing with your program though, you can eat so much food and you still lose weight. It's unreal. I love yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> cause hunger is not, hunger is not sustainable. What, when we favor single ingredient whole foods, the food volume is huge. Like you're yeah. not hungry, right? But if you eat very calorically dense foods that have a lot of calories in them, they're not going to take up nearly as much space in your stomach. And so that's very, when you're making poor food decisions, 
it, it's just really easy to be hungry and not feel satisfied versus single ingredient whole foods where you're eating like your plate is massive, but the calorie load is way down. It's just a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. And people often equate that. They'll be like, I wasn't eating enough food. I, my body was going into starvation mode or something. Like when I started eating more food, I started losing weight. And it depends how you categorize more food. Because mm -hmm. if it's from a calorie standpoint, no, you were consuming less. But if it's from a food volume standpoint, yes, you were consuming more. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And when you go out to restaurants, because I know you give a lot of advice for how to order when you're on your program. But when you go to restaurants, do you take your own advice? If it's a treat meal, no. Like if I'm just like, for example, what you guys asked about, like if it's parlor pizza, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not like modifying the <laughs> shit out of my pizza. But otherwise, yeah, absolutely. I'm not an overly saucy, like I don't like a lot of sauce on my food, which is I'm probably in the minority on that. Like some people just love really saucy, over the top flavorful food. I'm not that person. And so it's easier for me to make mods and not really think twice about it. Also just because I'm used to eating that way, but I absolutely ask for what I want in a restaurant. I don't, I'm not worried about, you know, being that quote unquote picky person because that's literally what the service is. Like you go to a restaurant, you pay for what you want. Right. And obviously you, when somebody is a great server, you accommodate and you tip them well and it's, it's awesome service. But I ask for what I want and I definitely make mods because um, I want, again, coming back to my highest priority being feeling good, I put that above being quote unquote that picky order. I would rather feel good than deal with a potential uncomfortable situation of asking somebody for what I want and then them thinking that I'm like an annoying customer, you know, like I want to feel good more than I care about the fact that somebody might think that I'm annoying. Yeah, for sure. And at the end of the day, if you're ordering something and making modifications, it's less than a minute of you telling them what you want and, and then getting what you want and feeling good. So it's like, yeah. And, and to be fair, servers are the like king and queens of modifications. Like they ask for exactly what they want when they go to restaurants. And so they know, they know, right? Like they, they see behind the scenes, they know what can be modded and what can't. And so if you're asking for a server for what you want and they're doing the same thing when they're going to restaurants too. So if it helps you think about it that way by asking for what you want, then yeah, you can do that. Like they mod their food too. That's yeah. true. I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. Um, so what does a, your typical work week look like? Typically I work every day, not a ton every day, but Monday through Friday I work a lot like are, are you thinking like a sample day or the week as a whole yeah like maybe um a day and then sort of a week because I know you've got so many different clients like how do you because I know when I did my program I sent my stuff to you on a Tuesday you would check in on a Friday like how do you manage all of that like track all your clients mm. I have a like moleskine moleskine is that how you say it moleskin Mollusk or something. Oh, and nobody knows. Okay. One of those planners. Yeah, I have one of those planners and I write everything <laughs> down in there. And I have check ins right now. Everybody checks in on either Tuesday or Wednesday. And so oh. I free up other days to, you know, prepare the podcast or prepare for an interview that I have with someone for the pod or do my learning. Um, do all the other necessary things that I need to do to essentially run my business or be the best coach I can. So um, as far as a day goes, I typically, I wake up, I will meditate for 10 minutes and then I'll go out in the kitchen and I get to work right away. So I just, I drink coffee and I work. That's my most productive time. And I always do the task that I want to do the least first because I want to get that out of the way. Otherwise, I know that if, for example, if I have to write, if I have to do writing for a podcast, if I don't get it done before noon, I'm not doing it. 
Like it's just, it's just not going to happen. And so I do the tasks that I want to do the least first, and then I work backwards from there. Um, my motivation tends to be highest first thing in the morning. And then if I'm going to work out that day, I'll work out after I get probably like two hours of work in. And then I'll have something to eat. I might go for a walk and listen to a podcast. I do two, two hours of learning Monday through Friday, so 10 hours a week. And then I'll probably get back to work when I get back from that walk. I might answer some more emails, maybe create some content of some sort for Instagram. And then I'll probably do some more learning again after that. And then I'll have dinner and shut it down for the night. And I check, I check my email two to three times per day max because email can be, and that's crazy for people because my business is solely email, which they're like, how is that possible? Like that's the only way I interact with clients. And it's the way that I view it though is if I'm going to do laundry, I don't do it one piece at a time, right? That would be insane. I wait till I have a whole load and I get it done. And so that way when I batch emails, it's far more effective and I'm not constantly distracting myself from what I was doing to check email, to go back to what I was doing. There's a, there's a cost there, the task switching cost. And so I limit emails to two to three times a day. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's about it. It's nothing fancy. So do you pick kind of what times to do your emails each day? Cause I'm sure like you wake up to a bunch of messages and then maybe later people reply or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll typically write first thing or prepare for the podcast the first thing because that's typically what I have the most resistance around doing. And then then I'll do check-ins like on a Tuesday or Wednesday, I'll do check-ins with clients and I'll email, I'll get back to all of them and then I'll go about my day and then I'll check email again maybe around five or six and get back to who's ever replied and then I'll wake up the next morning and do it all over again. So I, I it, it's rare that an email wouldn't go unanswered for like, you know, 12 ish hours or something like that, just because of what, what time I check it each day. But yeah, I, I like to batch that stuff because I just find it so much more time effective. And when I'm in the zone to answer emails, I just answer them all as opposed to going in one at a time. And like, I don't know about you guys. I don't, I take the notifications of email off my phone. I have to go into my email and actually manually refresh it because I don't want that just rolling around in the background. It, it just, it consumes me. Um, yeah. And the same thing for Facebook and Instagram. I have zero notifications on my phone. I have to, I have to go into the app to find out if I have anything. Do you guys do that too? Or how do, how do you manage your notifications? I like definitely for email, I turn my notification off, but since now I'm working from home quite a bit, I've actually turned it on. Cause I'm not used to having my computer on all the time at home. So just in case there is something, I just hear the ding kind of go off, but I, I don't kind of rush to it. I just kind of think, okay, I've got an email can mm. kind of do it. But, um, yeah. And other, I've got, I think Facebook and Instagram or Facebook is off. Um, but it's so true though. As soon as you see a little one or the red dot, it's like, Oh, I got to check it. But it's usually, it's, it's usually, it's nothing important that needs attention right away. And I think, especially during the time that we're going through now, I, I have felt over the past few weeks that I'm more on my phone and devices just looking at stuff. So this past week, I've like structured my week. I've put stuff in place so that I'm not glued and attached to all these things because it's just it's not great for the mind, I've learned. Um, but I think I like the batch email checking. Kind of. It's a bit difficult with work sometimes because if my bosses need something right away, I have to kind of be on it but um you know I like that kind of concept and turning notifications off too it's, you don't need to know what someone's new status is every two seconds <laughs> at least I don't no totally and with the emails I do appreciate the fact that some people don't have the type of job that like they have really time sensitive emails and you just that's a different story you can't do that but if you don't have really time sensitive emails then i don't see a reason why you wouldn't you know mm -hmm. how about you krista how many notifications do you get a day <laughs> <laughs> well 
I'm not very good at this. I'm definitely not unplugged ever from my job. I feel like I'm always just, I'm just on all the time because you, I guess I could structure it differently, but I also find that client relations is so much better in my job when you're just like on and ready, especially right now because um, there's a ton of weddings being rescheduled and things like that. So you just kind of have to be ready to go. So for my emails, I don't have notifications set on, but I do check it a lot, probably more than I should. (laughs) Instagram, I definitely have my notifications on, but that's for interaction uh, and the algorithms of Instagram, just Mm -hmm. to be on it with that. That's more for marketing than anything. Um, But I have recently set... Um, you can set like a time restriction for Instagram so I've set that for both my personal and my business one and then it sends you a reminder when you've hit that time and then you're like oh yeah I gotta get off here and that's been really helpful is it four so hours per day or five hours per day <laughs> <laughs> I started it at half an hour for my personal and 45 minutes for my work that's pretty good oh not bad at all and it's pretty good because once I updated my phone and you can see how much screen time you have I was like pretty disgusted by the amount of time (laughs) I spent on Instagram and Instagram is so it really affects your mind and I learned that when I came back from vacation because I wasn't really on it and I felt so good and then I came back and I was just constantly watching everyone's stories and it just really does affect your mindset a lot So Mm -hmm. I found setting the restrictions really does help. But for me, for work, I'm definitely, I can't unplug myself. It's very hard. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, so as you guys know, I used to be available essentially to all my clients, you know, from specific times via text. And Mm -hmm. I changed that because there's an expectation with text specifically that the responses are quite quick. And I just found I was glued to my phone, like just glued to my phone. And so I changed it to email for few or for two reasons. One, it's more work to email. And so people tend to think about their questions and put a little more thought into sending an email versus a text, because it might be like a question just popped into my head. I'm just going to text them right now without Mm-hmm. thinking about, well, do I know the answer to that question? How could I, you know, do I, do I even need to know the answer to this question right now? Whatever it may be. But, and then email is just, it's a little more thought out, I would say. Like when people, someone's going to send an email, it's just, it's just a tiny bit more work. And so they're more likely to be more pertinent questions, I guess, or questions that somebody really wants answered and they think about it just a little bit more first and it makes them less reliant on me which is exactly what I want long term because they might you know eventually they're not going to be working with me and so I want them to be able to you know answer as many questions for themselves as they can I feel like you kind of answered it but what do you eat in a day typically what's like because you always eat the same foods I feel like over and over again yeah (laughs) (laughs) I do Uh, I'll go periods of time like I might go a month or two where I eat basically the same things every day and then I'll switch it to something else that's just how I prefer to eat because it's sort of I just don't have to decide every meal it's just easy so lately I typically do I'll eat two meals a day sometimes I'll have a piece of fruit or something like that in the morning but maybe a shake, but typically two meals a day. And they're just really big meals because I, I don't want to cook all the time. I don't want to clean all the time. And I just prefer to feel like super satisfied after each meal. And it, I work my, I work my life, like life comes before my meals. Like some people work their day around their food. I like to work my food around my day. And as far as what I eat, it's like just basic stuff, a lot of white rice, um, a protein source of some sort, maybe meat, fish. And then I might do that like 
Lately, I've been doing that twice a day, just a bunch of rice, a bunch of veg, and a protein source of some sort, maybe some fruit mixed in here and there. Um, but other than that, it's nothing, nothing fancy. And when I'm lo- I have a goal of losing fat versus gaining muscle, the foods don't change. It's just the quantities. And that's the way that it should be. You should like, if you're trying to put on weight, it doesn't mean that you automatically just go for like burgers and shit all day. Right. You still want to keep the quality high, um, but the quantities change. And so that's how I think about it. And it's just basic. Like I eat a higher carbohydrate, low to moderate fat, moderate to high protein diet. And most people, you know, you hear like carbohydrates are like evil and they're making you fat and shit. And it's just, as long as you account for that with your fat intake, then you can totally eat a higher carbohydrate diet and still maintain, you know, body composition and stuff like that. And I feel better with that. So that's what I choose to do. And white rice is typically my food of choice. Mm. Not chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes, but like, Chocolate, people, it's so funny. People will be like, oh my God, I, I'm like having a sweet, car- I just, I crave sugar all the time. And they see chocolate as like a high sugar food, but it's also a really high fat food. And so yeah. the calories is really add up. There are probably more calories from fat in chocolate than sugar, but sugar is demonized right now. And they're like, oh man, <laughs> sugar cravings. And it's like, yeah. man, there's a lot of fat in there too. <laughs> it's so good though. Oh, it's delicious. So that is a wrap on the two-part interview that I had with my clients, Krista and Carmen DeCamillis. I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you did, let me know, and maybe we can put together something like this again in the future. As always, if you're interested in personalized one-on-one nutritional coaching and or workout design with me, you can head over to the website at n1fitness.com forward slash coaching. Also feel free to follow me up on Instagram at n1fitness and Marcus Sadu on Facebook. Thanks so much for listening and I will catch you on the next episode. See ya.